All right, well, give Brother Taylor a, a welcome as he comes tonight, would you? <laughs> Praise God. Hey, when, when you getting, when you getting, let me, let, I got two more things real quick. I'm closing. Uh, it's good to have Brooke Crawford with us here tonight. Amen. Praise God. Yes. It's been a while since she's been back. I know she's been back in the, in the Driven, right? Driven services and stuff. First time on a Wednesday night out here, though, right? All right, we're glad you're here. Brother Roy Parnell, I'm glad that you're here with yes. us tonight. Amen. We appreciate you being here. Amen. The rest of y'all just, uh, just home folk. That's good. Just family. You're backdoor family. Amen. I went to Katie Kramer's house the other day, and Jenner said, well, do we go in the front door or back door? And I said, I'm back door family. I'm going in the back door. <laughs> all right, now you can go. Praise the Lord. Uh, how this all come about, well, we was a pastor and myself was a talking, and we got to talking about the spirit of offense. And uh, one day... I was studying or something, and the Lord showed me that the spirit of offense is a, I called it a door spirit. Uh, I read some other people's opinions that had studied on this. They called it a gateway or a passageway. It all means the same thing. It is something that you do not want in your life. Amen. 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 And when I got to, I was talking to Sister Sheena after Pastor had asked me if I would minister on it, and she told me about something that I found very intriguing, if you want, that happened to her in this same area. And so I asked her uh, if she would share, because what she came and told me that had happened to her went right along with what the Lord had showed me and was showing me uh, about this spirit. And, 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 and it's a spirit that is, there's so little teaching about it, uh, it, it goes so unrecognized, yet it's a bombshell, mm -hmm. yeah. most especially spiritually. <clears throat> yeah. So, Sister Sheena, come up and share with us what you... Um, before I do, I just want to say that what I'm about to describe, you may not want children to hear, because it's a little intense. I'm going to be describing what I saw in the spirit. It was a Wednesday night, almost two years ago, February 23rd, 2011. I was here at church, and... Two things had been said to me that I could have taken offense to. I felt that there. And came on in, had the service as usual, but I had to leave early to go pick up Josie from karate. When I went out of the church, into the parking lot, out to my car, still dealing with this feeling, I saw something in the spirit. And what I saw, I will do my best to describe to you, it was a demon. It was laying its head on my soul. I saw my soul as a white mist just inside this area of my body. It laid its head on my soul. It was a pale gray, like maybe the color of death, completely, totally hairless, no hair whatsoever. Its eyes were a bit sunken in, red and absolutely full of evil. Its teeth, it smiled, and it had real thin lips, and it drew its mouth into a, a wicked smile. And I saw these teeth, and the best way that I could describe them to you, if you can see this at all, this is a black devil anglerfish. And I had to make another set of teeth and, and add it to this, so this is basically what the teeth look like in the mouth of this thing. And it had claws on its hand that looked something like this. Big black claws. And while it had one arm around me, laid its head on my soul, 
was dragging these claws with this evil smile down my soul, and I knew what was going to happen. I knew what he wanted to do. All I had to do was say, I receive the offense. But instead of saying that, I opened my mouth and I said, Lord, I know that what was said to me was spoken to me in truth. It was spoken to me in love. It was a confirmation to me on something that I needed to change and I do not take offense to it. So let me tell you what happened there and what would have happened. Everybody knows what this is if I don't end up getting myself stuck. If you notice this, this black devil angler fish has this little dangly light thing that things are attracted to and then it can devour. And I wrote the word offense there. Okay? I also, you know, the word of God says, set a watch over my, how does that go? It's leaving me right at the moment. Set a watch over my, my mouth, keep the door of my lips that I not sin against thee with my tongue. I wrote one for myself which says, set a watch over my soul and keep the door of my heart that the words and actions of others not offend me. And I wrote that back in May 27th of, of 07. So this is a treble hook, but I actually call it a trouble hook. And this is what the enemy desired to do. Now, it has three prongs, and I thought of these as one to hook the spirit, one to hook the soul, one to hook the body. And so it takes hold into the heart of man when it enters the soul. Um, Even Perry Stone, for any of y'all that know him, he said on March 26, 2011, he said, spirits enter in through holes in the soul. Amen. And it was, I hadn't heard that until after this had happened to me, and it was an absolute confirmation for me. So, also coming with the hook, you know, you've got your little sinkers, the weight. Well, if this is not dealt with, first of all, we don't even want to let this much happen. But sometimes it does. If this is not dealt with, this is what will happen. It grows. Now here's the hook. Here's the heart. Chains. Think of a... I did have a big gray balloon attached to this to be like the sinker. And I did have a weight on it, an anchor. So, you know, what an anchor is going to do is dig in and stop you. And the sinker will take you down to the bottom. So this is what he desired to do, was to tear the soul. And that's when I wrote that song a little later, months later, Bleeding Soul, Wounded Heart, Tearing My Insides Apart. Staying here, the devil steals. Decide to go, Jesus heals. So when I spoke out of my mouth and I said, I do not receive this offense, I felt that spirit leap away from me and just like it it just disappeared like a a puff of smoke and it was over so I was so thankful that I had not taken the offense that I really didn't need to take anyway When Sheena was telling me that, that went right along with what the Lord had showed me about this. I'm going to go into a little more detail. We're not going to hurry. Pastor's assured me if, if we need another night that I can take it. But the Greek word for offense is scandalon. Am I pronouncing that? Which means a snare or a trap. It's well named. Some people describe it as being the the part of a trap on which you put the bait on. But when you get in to full-blown offense, I'm telling you, it's like being in a bottomless hole with no bottom in it. 
And, and, and this, this, this spirit has went without any recognition uh, for so long. And, and, and like I say, how many of you know what a pedophile is? You know how a pedophile will pick out a child that they want. And they go through what they call a grooming process. And they'll groom that child. And, 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 and they gain that child's trust or confidence. And then they can leave with that child without even a fight. That child will just follow them off. This is the very same thing that happens with this spirit of offense. If you noticed what Sheena saw in the spirit, that spirit was grooming her. Trying to gain her trust. Telling her how wrong she had been done. This is the process by which they work. And if she had a given that, that spirit any kind of consideration, she would have been in a lot of trouble. There is nothing, listen to me, nothing has broke up more good friendships, marriages, churches, businesses and even countries that will compare to what offense has done. Now, hurt feelings are all right as long as you control them. But the minute they start controlling you, you're in for a ride. Now this is more of a teaching than a preaching. Because I, I want to be sure that we cover everything. But <clears throat> these door spirits, what they do is make an opening, as she was talking about, into your soul. Now when it comes to being to a fence, there, there's, there's two stages of a fence. One is when you are the offender. How this is described as being a, an offender or causing an offense is a, is a sinful person or a person being in great error. Now, I've always said... There's two ways, there's two types of murder. You can kill a man's flesh and he can live again. But if you kill a man spiritually, you have murdered him for eternity. And it talked about the, the tongue being full of, of poison. What does poison do? Absolutely. There's, there's been people murdered with just the tongue. There's been so little a teaching about being offended or about being an offender that people, we, we've not known how to understand what to do. But, but I was going to back up when, when Sheena was telling me about this spirit and what she saw and, and described this spirit, how she had seen this spirit in a vision. And I told her, I said, Sheena, draw me a picture of this thing. I want you to draw me a picture of what you've seen in the spirit. Well... After that, I was thinking today about, I thought, you know, something got to, I become under spiritual attack is what happened. They said, what are some people there? They'll think you're into Dungeons and Dragons. 
And I started to worry. Now, I want you to listen carefully. This is what I heard in my soul. And I started to worry about this, and I started thinking, well, you know, maybe I should skip the picture deal, Pastor Kelly. Maybe that's not necessary. But I'm telling you something. Every part of the Word of God is necessary. And so as I went along and got to thinking about this demon that she had described that the Lord had opened her eyes and allowed her to see and I was worrying about it all of a sudden in my soul in my spirit the Holy Spirit said they are created in the image of sin Our Heavenly Father, how we see these things, these demons, that's how He looks at sin. There is no rhyme nor reason to sin. That's why these things are so hideous looking. Because that's our Heavenly Father's view of sin when He sees it, and most especially in the life of one of His children. And while we're on the subject of sin, let me tell you something. Our Heavenly Father sees every sin as sin. He never finds any sin amusing, cute, or funny. And when the Spirit spoke to me, it said, we need to start looking at the situations through our Father's eyes. I'm sure we won't see the same thing we've been seeing through these carnal eyes. He's, Jesus said, if you're guilty of one sin, you're guilty of them all. Now what did he mean there? He meant sin is sin, And there is no respecter of sin. That's what he meant. Sin is sin. And and I'm not going to get carried away on this, but I'm telling you. The body, we have got things that are wrong in our life that we like doing, and so we change the title of it. We've changed the title. It said in the Bible, it said in the last days they will call right wrong and wrong right. He was not talking about sinners. They were already doing that then. He was talking about his children were going to do these things. And you see it. I was telling Brother Frankie, it's like the the children of God have developed this sin meter. This, this, This conscious sin meter. And as long, Brother Parnell, as that meter don't go past a certain degree, well, we're all right. But now if it passes it, we better look out because we could be getting on shaky ground there. But I'm telling you, our Heavenly Father looks at every sin as sin. I don't care how little a snake is, he is still a snake. And I don't care how insignificant you call a sin, sin, it is still a sin. And we need to look at it as such. That is what has undermined the authority and power of the believers. Amen. It's left us powerless. Because we are not looking at things through our Father's eyes. We say, Brother Taylor, how in the world can we do that? Do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? Do you have the Spirit of God living in you? You can look through the eyes of the Holy Spirit and you will see exactly what your Heavenly Father sees. And that's time when we start doing that, Brother Parnell. You know what first thing we're going to see? We're going to start seeing the demonstration of the Spirit confirming the Word of God again. But we have got to look at things as our Heavenly Father looks at them. 
And we are not doing that. Oh, maybe a few things. We see eye to eye on a few things. But the truth is, the majority of things, we don't see eye to eye with our Heavenly Father. Amen. And it's time we call black, black, and white, white. The reason the children of God go on sinning is they don't look at what they're doing to sin anymore. It's all right if it's up to a, to a certain point. You know what? If you've got a guy, a fibber and a yarn teller over here, do you know what you have? Two liars. If you've got a, a two people working at a convenience store and one just takes a pack of gum every night before he leaves, and the other one takes $20 out of the cash register, do you know what that place of business has working for them? Two thieves. Because being a thief is not measured in dollars and cents. So no matter how little we see a snake, we need to call it a snake. And that's what we're not doing, people. We're not doing that. <clears throat> Amen. Did you know what they said that if a chigger, how many even knows what a chigger is? They said that if a chigger was the size of a dog tick, one bite would kill you. One bite. Okay, now Jesus talked once about a fence. And he said, he said, Fence is going to come. But woe to the man by which it comes. That means there's not a good outlook for an offender. Woe means bad. Here's what, here. Well, never mind. Going on. Being offended, which means there's two stages by which you can become offended. It means to stumble, to have, to have stumbled, or have fallen away. Now, to have stumbled is a temporary state of being offended. It's like when you, uh, somebody hurts your feelings and you start crying. Oh, I hate that person. I wish they'd die. I never want to see them again. But the next morning or a day or two later, you say, you come to your senses and you say, you know what? I didn't mean that. I, I really don't hate them. I don't want them to die. You know, the truth is, I really do love that person. Yeah. But that's just, that, that is the temper, that's just having stumbled. And believe you me, that's as far as you want to go. That's too far. But we do these things, it's like when we was explaining this spirit, this demon. I'm not trying to glorify or preach demons. But being as they are the enemy, we do need to understand them. And the strategies by which they attack us. I mean, that's just using good sense. Mm -hmm. Because by not knowing your enemy, 
You'll get murdered and never knew you was under attack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. You know, if I know somebody's coming after me to beat me up, I'm going to go hide. <laughs> I might not go that far, but I'd be unavailable now in this state of life. <laughs> but if I just walked around the corner and nobody told me, and I just turned the corner and whop, that's how these demons are doing us. Yeah. The Word says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. We wrestle against the spiritual world, yeah. in other words. The real war is not your neighbor. No. It's who your neighbor has let influence him yeah. or given authority over him. Yeah. Yeah. Now we can't take over a man's will. No. No but we do have power over all spirits and demons. Amen. If we will stop looking at the man and start looking behind the scene, yeah. we'll start walking in the truth, one thing, because yeah. we'll start seeing the truth. We can control that spirit that's operating in them. Jesus proved that. Every time he said, be silent and come out of him, he didn't affect that man's self-will. But he did have authority over the spiritual world. And did you know, if you're a child of God, he gave you that authority. Amen. We just got to walk in it. <clears throat> All of the right paths are laid out for us. And we're over here trying to blaze our own. Mm-hmm. To have stumbled means it's just a temporary state of offense. That's to stumble. When you come to your senses and realize what you have done, and you say, you know what? That ain't what the Word says. You know, that ain't really me. That ain't love, Brother Frank. I'm sure that Jesus wouldn't have done that. You see, we're being guided by the Word out of a situation because we yield to the Word. Once, our, once them little feelings gets calmed down, then we're able to yield to the Word. And the Word, lining back up with the Word, puts us back on the right path back in the right state of mind and right state of heart. And then there's a state of being of offending where you fall away. Full-blown offense. In that stage the Word of God has, you, you, you do not yield to the Word of God anymore. It can't lead you out because you're no longer interested in what it says. And like I said, people in these full blown stages of being offended. Once you are in that, there no longer has to be an offender. Everything that comes along offends you then. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because you're already offended. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what causes the best of friends to separate. Yeah. People that love them, each other from childhood that will no longer speak to each other. Husband and wives. 
coming to the point of offended that they no longer want to be together. It destroys friendships. It destroys marriages. Did you know practically every church, I'm going to say 95% of the splits in churches start from one member being offended. Here's what happens to an offended person. When a person gets into full-blown offense, the first thing they start doing is trying to gather other people to them. Not only have they caused themselves to fall in sin, now they are causing others to share in their sin. Do you see how it just progresses and progresses? Here's a sad thing about a person that falls in to full-blown offense. There's a vicious cycle here in offense because the same spirit in the offender is also in the offended. And a person, when they allow that spirit of offense to get inside them, it will make a vicious circle and pretty soon they will become the offender. It makes a circle and you become the very thing that caused you to shipwreck. I'm telling you something good tonight. If you'll listen to me, we can rise up a little higher in the sight of our Heavenly Father. Amen. We got to understand, we got to get back and realize it's not flesh and blood that we wrestle against. And when we stop that and get on with our Father's business in the spiritual realm, this would be a lot better world living. For sure, coming to church would be a lot better. <laughs> Husbands and wives, understand this and avoid this trap, this trap, this snare. The voice courts would go broke. Because I'm going I'm to bet you, if I was a betting person, I would bet you that 95% of divorces come from one spouse or the other becoming offended. And everybody pays. In that case, it's the children that pays. Now then, when this spirit of... How much, oh, okay. I'm not going to hurry on this. You need to know this. Pastor is, is offered us another night if we need it. But when this spirit of offense, when you allow it, when, when, you, when it pets them hurt feelings, I'm going to tell you how it does it. Boy, it'll, it'll take them hurt feelings of yours and just, oh, and it'll just stroke them. I'm telling you, hurt feelings is a pathway to destruction. And this soul spirit will just groom you and he'll agree with you and he'll tell you how mean they are and then pretty soon he will tell you how much you hate them. And then he will tell you how you wish that they would die and you'll repeat it. He'll tell you how you never want to see them again. And pretty soon, he's doing your thinking for you. And it just becomes a habit. That's the same way with a person that's an offender. They do it so long, some of them, that they do it out of habit and don't even realize anymore what they're doing. They've lost sight of reality. But that spirit was trying to groom. He wanted in there. All she had to say was all right. But there's one thing I want you to notice. He had to have her approval. Yeah. Yeah. 
And when her approval wasn't given, he had to leave. I'm going to cover this one more thing right here, and then we're going to wait. Because that's just one of the first spirits that follows a fence. One of the first ones to enter in that gateway is the spirit of unforgiveness. Now then, why is it necessary for this spirit to be the first one to come in? Because he cuts loose all of your spiritual ties. And this is something we need to talk about a lot. The Word says, that if you do not forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your debts. So, now this is just my opinion. Now this is something that, that the Lord just deals with me about this. You can take it, you can eat the, the grass and spit out the sticks. <laughs> But it says, if you do not forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your debts. Do you think he's ever going to change his mind on that? No. No. So that is an established fact in the Word of God, is it not? Okay. Now listen to this. And you listen very close. You make your own determination on this part of it. It says, is there any sick among you? Don't leave me. Let them call for the elders of the church. They'll anoint them with oil. Pray the prayer of the faith. And the Lord will lift them up. And if they have committed any sin, He will forgive them. I want you to pay attention to what's said here. This verse of Scripture, by, by His own words, He says that if He heals you, then He has to forgive any sin you have committed. Is that what it says? Okay. What if, he, what if you have got in the position that He cannot forgive you? Absolutely. By his own words, he bound healing and forgiveness together. Jesus said, which is easier, to say your sins be forgiven or rise up and walk? I want you to think about that. If he cannot forgive you because you are holding unforgiveness by his own words he said if you do not forgive he will not forgive you and on the same thing he said that if he healed you he would forgive you and if he cannot forgive you come on now I'm a preaching to you right now We need to consider this. I'm telling you what the Word says here. Amen. If He says, if you hold unforgiveness, that He will not forgive you if you hold unforgiveness, and He's bound Himself to, to forgive in a healing situation, if He goes ahead and heals you, and you're holding unforgiveness in your heart, He also has to then forgive you. Amen. 
I, I, I see people, and don't go off saying, Brother Taylor said, because you had to go to the altar for three or four times for healing, that he said you were holding unforgiveness in your heart. That is not what I'm saying. But, but on the other hand, it could be very likely. I'm saying this would be a, if you're having trouble receiving healing, this would be a good place to start looking is in your heart and see what's in there. Is everybody, am I, am I leaving you? No. I, I was telling, I, I've got two instances about this heart thing. Over my community, a group of, of, of my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus were getting together like on a Thursday night and they were having a, a little Bible study and prayer meet. Well, they found out that I was a preacher, so they asked me, I was good friends with the person at whose house they was having it, and she asked me, she said, well, would you just come, if you could come and be with us on some Thursday night? And I said, sure. So it rolled around to a Thursday night, and I told Aunt, and something happened. I don't, I don't remember, was you working then, baby, or what? Yeah, Ann was working night. So I decided to go up there. I want you to pay attention. We went through our little Bible study, Pastor, and this woman there had cancer, Brother Eddie, been diagnosed with cancer. So after the Bible study, they got in the living room there, and they all gathered around her and went to praying for her. Well, I was in this little foyer type room right here. Uh, uh, there used to be a lady, uh, a Spanish lady went to church. Her name was Frances. I don't know if any of y'all remember. She used to sit right in here, and her and her husband. I think his name was Joe, or I can't remember. But anyway, when they all started gathering around her, Brother Parnell, and praying for her, I started in there, and the Spirit of the Lord told me, wait. Wait. So I just turned around and went back in there where Francis and, their, and this friend of hers were sitting. Well, they all prayed over her, and everybody started leaving, and this, for some reason, this woman that they had prayed for come in there. And I felt led to ask her. I said, ma'am, is there anything in your heart that would keep you from being healed? And she just looked at me like, and she said, well, for instance, what, for instance? I said, just off the top of my head, I said, what about unforgiveness? And immediately, immediately, she broke down, and she went to weeping uncontrollably. It was pitiful. And she cried, and she cried, and she cried. And then she got where she could kind of pull herself back together, and she said, Brother Taylor, yes, I, I do. She said, my mother mistreated me my whole life. And she died and never told me that she was sorry. And all of a sudden, I felt another presence in that room. I'm telling you. Somebody else joined us. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I went over to that lady, and I'm telling you that the power of God was so powerful in that room, and I laid my hands and prayed for her, and I knew she was healed. Amen. And Frances was sitting at the other end of the room. She said, she said, Brother Taylor, I can feel that anointing plumb down here. And so her and her friend got up, and they just wanted me to pray for them. While that anointing was there, they just didn't have, they just wanted prayed for. Yeah. It was that obvious that we had been joined. Amen. I myself, if Rick and Jones Salisbury is here, they tell you. I came up to Tulsa one time looking for work for me and Ann moved up here, and I come down with a kidney stone. 
And Rick and Joan had to drive me plumb back to Arkansas. They drove me back in the middle of the night. One drove my vehicle to bless their hearts and come back that night. I'm telling you what, I'm so blessed to have them. But I laid in that floor for a week. We couldn't afford, I couldn't afford to go to the doctor. We didn't handle pain medicine. When Dr. D gave me, when Joni took me down there and he diagnosed me, what he gave me, that was it. And I laid in that floor and I rolled and I just had to, I just had to keep moving. The pain was so horrific, I, I, just could, I couldn't get no rest day and night. And it was about 3 o'clock in the morning and, 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 and we lived in a big old trailer down there. And in our master bedroom, the master bathroom was right off the edge of it. And, and my side of the bed is right here by the door. And I would lay and I'd put my heels that had linoleum yeah. on the floor and in them trailers, them floors, them trailers was real cold. So I'd put my heels up on that tub and I would lay there on that cold floor and just continually move. And about three o'clock in the morning, I finally got tired. <laughs> and I got bold. Sometimes pain will make you bold. And I looked up and I was laying flat on my back looking straight up. And I said, Lord... I believe in healing, and you know I believe in it. I knew he knew I believed in it. And I said, I want to know why I'm not healed. Just like that. And that little voice, <laughs> that little voice spoke to me, and all it said, he said, Examine your heart. Oh, mercy. You know what? I didn't have to lay there and think about it. The minute he said it, I knew exactly, I knew exactly what he was talking about. And the only prayer I could think to pray, I said, Father, I confess to you in the name of Jesus that in my heart I am a hypocrite. Please forgive me. And I had a visitor. Woo! Amen. I'm telling you what. I had a visitor. And the power of God, it was just like it pinned me to the floor. And I went to praying in tongues. And all of a sudden, it just lifted like it came, and I was totally healed, 100%. I was just as healed right then as I am standing before you right now. Amen. I got up out of the floor. I walked in, and Ann would lay on my side of the bed by the door so she could keep an eye on me and and be there if I needed her. And I woke up and I said, I woke her up and she said, what's the matter? I said, scoot over. She said, well, how come? <laughs> I hadn't been in bed in a week. And I said, because the Lord just healed me. And I got in that bed and I mean, you talk about going to sleep. <laughs> but can you see if there's sin in the camp? Come on now. I'm going to explain forgiveness now. Most people does not have a clue what forgiving means or what it does. Amen. We have come up with this carnal deal about forgiving and unforgiveness. Now, unforgiveness, I'm going to give you an example of what unforgiveness is like first. Unforgiveness is like taking a hurt, taking a chain, binding that hurt to you, and giving it permission to hurt you any time it decides to. Amen. Yeah. Forgiveness? How many of you think when your heavenly Father forgives you for a sin that he's saying what you did was all right. Raise your hand if you believe that. That he's saying, well, it's all right, son. 
it wasn't really that bad. You know, it was all right what you did. Let me tell you something. Forgiveness never justifies a wrong. Forgiveness never says that when somebody wrongs you that that was right. Forgiveness says, I refuse to let that hurt me anymore. Forgiveness is a tool of freedom given to the, the body of Christ. And it will work in the sin world too. But there's something else it does. Forgiving. It makes you like your father. It makes you like your father. Pastor, I'm going to cut it. It's after 8 o'clock. Okay? I'm going to run. Well. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to cut it off right here. But I do have a part in the ending where it says, what do we do? So if you're here next Wednesday night, I appreciate you letting me minister to you. I hope you will consider what I said. Become aware of who your enemy is. You can't fight your enemy if you don't know who he is. God bless you, Pastor Kelly.